Okay, so as we've been discussing on the lab, um, there were some issues on lab station four, if you're assigned there, um, with being able to see the correct file name but not being able to load it. Best guess, and I'll check this after class, is that that file got overwritten. Uh, Jimmy checked that and thinks that maybe the startup config got overwritten with Dyn Voice or vice versa. In other words, the same file got saved in both names, which would throw it off, obviously. And in Lab Station 3, um, I had one user report that there were no user accounts. What's happening with that? It, we're doing stuff so that I can teach you <laughs> the dial planning and isolation. You never do this in isolation. And so the stuff we're doing is simply stuff that AdTrans never had to mess with. The people down there know what we're doing. They've all sat right where you are, just not when we were doing <laughs> invoice over IP. They did it on the older circuit switch system. And so there is, you've seen about half of the config procedure in terms of saving configs. From the CLI, what you're doing is copying manually, you know, just like you've done on Cisco forever, you know, copy, run, start. You're doing a variation on that. But there are two files involved. Startup-config is all that stuff you list out and all the commands you send um, for you know, the kind of stuff you've always done on a router or a switch or anything like that. When you create users and when you create dial templates and when we define users and when we create IP phone configs, those are actually written somewhere else. I thought the easy answer to that was Dyne Voice dash config. It's apparently more complex than that. <laughs> And the problem is we can't see everything where it's written because some of it's just done in these magical little back rooms that you can't see in memory looking through it. So um, what I'm going to have to do is get on the phone with our uh, folks at AdTran. They've looked over this lab and said, yeah, that'll be fine. But I bet they've never had to do any of this. So um, did anybody complete the lab at this point? Okay. Nope. Any issues? Okay. Did anybody go through, and when you get to Section 2, Part C, around the fourth step, where I have you uh, messing with the existing voice accounts, did, you, did anybody get in there and find that there were no voice accounts? You did? Any problem? Could you go ahead and work on through? Yep. Okay. Okay. But you both did fine, no problem with? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there was, that's the one where. Yeah, that's right. Ask me a question to use my memory. That's good. Was that the one where there was the analog at that? Yes. Basically where you end up, <laughs> basically where you end up is with no users in there. That's where I want you to end up. And it sounds like you're getting, some of you are getting there a different way, but getting there. What I, I mean, what I'm trying to preserve for you, I'm trying to, trying to do, trying to set up where you don't have to have so much cookbook, just delete this, delete this, delete this, delete this, delete this. You'll notice the lab was a lot shorter this time. <laughs> Uh, I did away with a bunch of that. So, okay. Um, I'm sorry? Really? On all the lab stations? It's probably the easiest way to do it is going to be just to load the default build a config, and then delete. Okay. We're far enough along, and since most of you are able to complete it, we're not going to go back through it again. <laughs> you know the steps now. I mean, you're far enough along to troubleshoot it with me, so I'm not going to worry about it. We'll chase down that issue for next time. Did you 
in working through this, do you kind of see how dial plans pieces are working together, Matt? Did you notice the differences between the way we've talked about dial plan in our exercises and what's going on in the voice over IP system? And I perfectly and perfectly <laughs> specifically gave it to you that way so that we talked about it in a circuit switch environment, a pretty simple environment, and then had you work in a lab environment where there's that extra piece in the middle. Um, we're going to talk about that some today. But what, what are the difference between those? What, if you had to boil the difference between what we've talked about in our paper projects and the lab configuration you did in terms of what you had to put in, what would you, what would you boil it down to? What would you say the differences were? Thundering silence. Where's the phone interface? Yeah, let me go. Let me go ahead and just pull up my slide here. And this is really why I've had this. This point is really why I've had you going through one form of this in terms of. Come on, hand. Do what you're doing. Okay. This is what we've done. This view right here is what we've done on paper. Circuit switched. This is a straight up you <laughs> point to point. I'm going to stitch together this path across these existing links. They're always there. When we put together a path for a call, it stays there forever. The advantage of that is it's pretty straightforward. You know, all of the intelligence, all of the identity for those dial plan entries exist in the switches, period. End of story. The phones don't have an ID. Remember we talked about that. The identity for that phone is whatever you program on the port that it's physically connected to. And that was the way the world worked until the late 90s. Practically, for most installations, the way the world worked until eight or ten years ago. So we've, uh, we have almost undone 80 years of business telephony in less than a decade. In the next five, I'll guarantee it'll be gone. <laughs> so that's why I'm kind of doing this this way. The lab I had you do, basically this site, that you, <laughs> this site that used to be on this screen that used to be hanging from the ceiling, the site that... I've had you working in is analogous to being at one of those sites. Okay? All the phones are local. Now, I want to be real careful about the term local. We're going to visit it several times. What's local mean? Nearby. Nearby? What's another way we could think about local, particularly in terms of telephony? Same business, okay, so on net, in other words. What else? Anyone you're going to talk to on a regular, regular semi-regular basis. Okay, I can see that. I can see that. That's not, not one I thought of, but I can see that. Looking at this map, talk to me about the term local. Let me, let me get your imagination going here for a second. If I remove this link from Atlanta Interface H to Nashville Interface I, I take that link away, poof, it's gone. How would Atlanta have to call Nashville? Okay, so it would have to go through another site. Okay, now... In addition, let me remove Atlanta Interface E and San Francisco Interface C. Now how would Atlanta have to call Nashville? Okay. You can't, 
Right. You can and you can't. It depends on how you want to answer the question. If we're talking about the enterprise network, I want to run it on my network, I've just eliminated your ability to do it. What's the only choice I have left? Going through the PSTN. I dial out through the LEC. It goes to the IXC and then delivers it down. What's the problem with that? Yeah, you pay for it by the minute. Now, that's getting less and less common, but it's still fairly common for business. Okay, local in that term suddenly gets kind of hard to define. You know, we grew up. I did more than you guys. But still, all of you grew up with an idea of a local call being something, as, uh, as we said, very close by, physically close in Murray, maybe Hazel or something like that, certainly within the county. What do you guys think, of, what do you consider a local call on your cell phones? Do you, do you consider that there is a local call on your cell phone? Let me, let me, let me, before we go further, let me clarify something. Anybody in here pay for long distance separately on their cell phone? I haven't had a yes answer to that question in a long time, but those plans still exist, believe it or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the old PSTN days, remember that hierarchy we looked at? Local, switch, and then there was a toll, and then on up that hierarchy. The division between a local call and a long distance call was at the toll office. And depending on what particular square of geography you were standing in, calls between two local switches that passed through a shared toll office could be local calls or they might be long distance. In West Kentucky, the toll offices, there was one toll office basically for the Jackson Purchase. It was in Paducah. If I called another local office, with one exception that I can think of, if I called another local office, I was charged long distance. Now hold on to that thought, long distance. Okay. The decision was made because my call passed through that toll switch in Paducah. Now the exception was Paducah and Lone Oak, which are right next to each other. Okay. Two separate offices. They both fed through a toll office. But those calls were considered local. Okay. Legally, those calls, remember the term ladder line? What was a ladder line? Ah. Uh, Four-letter acronym from two weeks ago. <laughs> Local access and transit area. Basically, a ladder line separated local and long-distance traffic legally. Not from the carrier's point of view. The call I just talked about, Murray to Paducah or Murray to Benton or Murray to Mayfield, all stayed within Bell South. From a legal point of view, that was a local call because it didn't cross a ladder line. From a billing point of view, and this is the part that's mostly gone away, from a billing point of view, that was a long distance call because it passed through toll. Okay. Now the reason I'm beating on this, it's basically gone away, is to point out that local is as much definition as it is anything else. And that's actually where we get into some interesting issues with voice over IP systems. I don't think any of us would argue that from one of these phones to another one of these phones on this one switch on this local network, we would consider that a, quote, local call. I know it's an enterprise system. We're not talking about the public network. But from the point of view of how this call is all put together, that'd be a local call, right? Never leaves the site. Okay? What happens when I have a phone that is going to turn on, connect to this server, load a profile from this server, have a number assigned from this server, 
but is physically located a thousand miles away. Is that a local call? Okay. What's why, why let me let me take the positive side first. Why is that a local call? Network. And I, I, I know I'm slicing and dicing words here. I'm trying to get you to think a particular way. If I register, if I go through that process I just talked about, and I'm choosing my words carefully because we haven't actually looked at the phone boot process yet. <laughs> Don't worry, it's close by in your future. But if I have a phone that from the point of view of locating that identity from a network point of view, and that's what we've been doing, right? You built user accounts in that lab that are the identity of these phones. 111, 211, so on and so forth. You built that in one switch, the phone turns on and gets that identity and says, here I am in some form or fashion. If it's a hard phone, it does it one way. If it's a soft phone, it does it another way. But basically, when those phones turn on, what they're saying is, here I am, and the here is from a network point of view, an IP point of view. In this network, all of the IP addresses you're dealing with are on the same local network, which I'm betting is what you meant when you said network. So let me pose this question. If I take that phone and I unplug it from this Ethernet and I carry it to my house and assume Assume that all the routers in between are set up. That's a whole other can of worms we'll open up much later on. And I plug it in in my home network. That phone goes out, goes through my router, goes across the Internet, goes through our corporate router, touches this switch, gets its identity, downloads its config, everything's there, and yet it's sitting on my home network and I make a call. Is that a local call? Not on the same local network. It's on my local network at home. Now, now we're getting down the line. We're talking. <laughs> what I'm trying to get you to think of is local is more how we define the call. Okay. If you remember when we talked about signaling, what does signaling do in a telephone network? What's its purpose? I'm sorry? That's one thing it does. What else does it do? You mean like it rings a bell or something like that? Yeah, that's one thing it does is alert the user that there's a call. What else does signaling do? There was, we had a definition of it. Probably ought to brush up on those basic terms here for a little bit. Signaling is the communication that controls the network and the setup of calls. So signaling is how I communicate from this phone to the switch where I want that call to go and how this switch communicates with the network anything that's necessary to get that call where it's going and how the switch on the other end recognizes that there's a call coming in, knows where to send it, and how the switch on the other end lets the user know. In other words, it's controlling all of this stuff we've been talking about. If we're in a circuit switch world, it's actually stitching that path together. If we're in a packet world, which is what we're going to spend most of the semester looking at, I'm using protocol control to route my file transfer, if you will, my stream to your phone. Okay, so I'm controlling that whole process. That's the signaling piece. From a signaling point of view, my phone at home sitting on my local network is a local call. From a media point of view, from where I have to send my data stream, that's an external call. Is it long distance? I don't know that long distance really has other than a legal definition, I don't know that long distance really has a definition in here. Let me give you another view of this. 
There's our old friend, the circuit switch network. This was a nice, simple world. This was the world of when you opened a car hood, there was lots of room under the hood, no computers. You could work on it under a shade tree. You know, yes, I'm nostalgic. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I am the age I am. Here's what we're dealing with now. This is actually what we're going to be building through the semester. And you've seen this. You've seen 90% of that network in lots of classes. What have I got there in the middle? I've got a mesh of four routers. You guys know how those work. We've got a couple of ethernets on the end. We assume that off of the other routers there are other ethernets. I just didn't draw them in the picture. Okay. In, our, in terms of OSI, we have layer two, layer two, layer two, layer two, layer two, all around. In terms of layer three, I've got a layer three network here. I've got a layer three network here. Yes, there are layer threes in here. And I keep track of where I'm going by layer three network. Okay. So in that term, I don't, do you care or know when you try to go to Amazon.com, do you know or care the exact end-to-end -end path that that call takes? No, you don't. How do you view the world? You view it just like this. There's an IP cloud. There's a point on the edge of that cloud where you connect. <laughs> then a miracle occurs, and then it comes out the other end. Obviously, it's not quite that simple <laughs> or, or that providential in, in, in the way it works, but... That's the way we can think about it. If I'm going to send a call from this network to that network, I don't care what's in the middle. I'm going to consider that a direct path between those two because that's how it's going to appear to me. Now, there are a multitude of sins in that that can cause real problems, and we will look at them. But this is the way we're going to look at the world for a little while. Okay. So... In that case, it doesn't really matter how far away I am because the way I look at any other remote network that I directly connect to is just that. <laughs> My outside router interface goes to their outside router interface, and that's it. What, what did I do? Oh, no, you need to tell them Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Math. Oh, math. So basically, we're talking about one hop. Now, realistically, you do a trace route. You know, there may be a dozen routers in the middle of that. But I don't know and I don't care about any of that stuff. It sometimes causes a problem. Then I have to worry about it. But generally, I don't. I think about just the other interface on that other router that is the destination of my call. From that point of view, Really, the only thing we have is local, which means it's here and we're all registered on the same switch, or it's somewhere else and it's registered on another switch, or there's that third case where it's actually, the phone's actually over here, but it's registered back to this switch. So really, we have a world that's divided into on net, my enterprise, and everything else. Kind of makes the world easy. What was part of our design process for dial planning? What was the first thing I said to do? If we're looking at a map and I said, you know, here's San Francisco, here's Nashville, here's Louisville, here's Hazel, the center of the network, you know, what, what did I say to divide your calls into? I'm sorry? Exactly. What did, the what did the templates, what did I say to think about those templates as? Um, as uh, yeah. Call types. And I didn't mean some big technical definition when I put that term in front of you. I simply meant from the point of view of my system, where are we calling? You know, well, I'm going to call from one extension to another extension. That's a local call. By the definition mm -hmm. we're doing of local, if they're all sharing this device, this switch, that's a local call. I can have from 
my extension to an extension at another office. And I can actually do that a couple of ways. One, the phones at that other office are registered with my same switch, in which case they are a local call. Or I can have another switch at that end that those local phones register with, and I have a connection to them. It may still all be on my private network, but then I've just got this world again. Okay. Well, is that a local call? No, but it's an on-net call, so it's still within my enterprise. What if I need to call my cell phone? Is my cell phone on-net for my local network? No. Is my cell phone on-net for my enterprise? Not unless my enterprise is the cellular network. <laughs> if I work for Verizon, I guess maybe it could be. But probably it's not. So that's going to be a call somewhere else. So instead of local and long distance and all that, in that case, we're really defining extensions, if you want, instead of local. Does that term sound familiar? That's why your ad, that's why your ad trend uses that term. And believe it or not, they spend a long time deciding to use that term instead of something else for on-net phone-to-phone -phone calls because of this whole discussion we're talking about. Okay. Now, I realize to you guys, you've worked, you've lived with this your entire life. You've worked with this for years. Uh, you, you, this, is, this is a piercing glimpse into the obvious from an IP point of view. I get that. I know that. I'm counting on it. What I'm trying to get you to think about is how we adapt that wonderfully flexible model to something that is about as old as humans, voice communication. Because we all want the voice network to do particular things that have absolutely nothing to do with the technology underlying it. We expect them to do certain things. We expect low latency. Remember when we had that discussion? We expect low delay. No. We expect consistency of delay, no jitter, in other words. And that circles back around, to use George Rice's term, circles back around in the design to how we build this underlying network. So decisions you make about all of this come into play with how we design the whole data network. Do I really want, could I run my entire enterprise off of one switch? Yeah, and companies commonly do. If I have an enterprise of 100,000 people, even though I could mechanically run that, I could electronically run that off of one server, do I want to? What's the problem with running everything off one server? It goes down. <laughs> if it goes down, I've got 100,000 people that are seriously ticked. On the upside, they can't call me. You know, on the downside, sooner or later, they're going to find a way. So I need to think about this in terms of loading. I need to think about it in terms of what my users need to do. I need to think about if it absolutely requires this much processor, this much memory, this much whatever to support my calling, I need to divide that up and file, have some fail-safe for it. Okay? That's kind of why I'm talking through this this way. In the scheme that I just laid out up there, How would you classify, if we were going to take this world, this circuit switch world that you did the problem on, and I'm going to convert this to voice over IP, how would you classify calls? What call types would you have? Extensions, obviously we already talked about that. What else do we have? We're making up our own terms. Well, how would, remember that what we're trying to do is to think of a way to take this term and match it to a dial pattern that we can easily deal with. Okay. What do, when we did this dial plan, what did all the extensions share as a characteristic?
I'm talking about these. All the extensions on, in that particular problem were four digits. Yeah. Now, it could be three, it could be two, it could be five, but it's some number of digits that makes sense in our plan. Okay? If I'm sitting in Nashville, certainly the other extensions in Nashville would fall in that. What if I want to call Atlanta? We actually worked this problem two ways, or at least discussed it two ways. We used steering digits in some cases, and in other cases we didn't. What, what other call types would we have? Nashville to Nashville. What else? If I'm in Nashville on one of those extensions, where else might I call? Okay. So, LEC, in other words, that geographically, geography, <laughs> geographically local off net, if you want to put a bunch of $5 terms on it, calls to my physical local area that are not in my enterprise. And I'm going to do something like, you know, nine, I think we used in it, nine, did we use seven digits on that? Nine plus seven? Okay. What else? I'm sorry? Within the enterprise? Okay. What do we, what do we want to call those? Okay. So uh, it, it, let's use um, let's use eight. Daniel Daniel suggested that, that I think, and or eight x x x x. Where else might we call? And then this would be what do we say on. Net, remote maybe, calls to other extensions in our enterprise that aren't in our geographic location. These two could be combined. Kind of depends on how big your network is and what you're trying to accomplish. I could have all the extensions come back to one place if it's a fairly small company. If it gets very large, I probably want to split it up so that I can divide the load some. What else would we have? Long distance meaning I'm trying I'm trying to get away from saying local and long distance as descriptors. Okay. Off net. So one NXX NXX XXXX and this is XXXX, there we go. And this is going to be geographically, why did I have to spell that word? <laughs> geographically remote off net. Now, I don't expect you to type all these in. What I'm doing with this is to point out that our thought process really is the same. I mean, we haven't come up with something that's vastly different in terms of how we think about this. We're still thinking about what kinds of calls are we making, and we're still matching patterns that I can steer those with and identify those calls with. I'm just applying those differently in the hardware. Now, I am aware that we've only talked about this in our lab right now. We've got a couple of things we need to look at before I go any further on that. Sure. Call, yeah. These, with the exception of extensions, and even that one, they're different people use different terms. Help my time doing. Okay. Other than the fact that I need you to be clear <laughs> when you're telling me this on assessment, I don't really care what you call these. 
I do care that you think about them tactically. And by that I mean how do I accomplish separating of all the possible calls we could have entering this switch that it's going to have to make a decision on, how do I separate those? That's really what we're saying. Okay. And if you go back and compare this with the list we have, this is basically identical. The only thing that's missing is 911 and 9911, which we'd probably put up under here. We'll deal with that a little later. There are some issues with 911 and packet. Um, the pieces we're missing that we haven't done on paper. I had you do this on paper first because this, as I said, this is a pretty simple way of doing things. It worked very well. It worked great. It just, we outgrew it. The simplicity of this is everything's in the switches. I don't have to worry about external stuff. Okay? We've complicated that world. Okay? Where's the switched interface? Where's the first switching decision, voice switching decision made when I pick up this phone to call that phone? I'll get you to, th I'm sorry? I think it was made on the, uh, on the data link here because they're all, they're all You mean right here? Yeah, yeah, on the phone interface. You And you saw this in your lab, right? What, you, if when you were going through the lab, you ended up at um, extension dial strings. Basically, it's an accept rule for what is allowed to leave this phone. Remember the change we've made is now we have a lot of processing power here. Some of it's used for coding voice. Most of it is used for analyzing calls and seeing whether I'm allowed to put traffic that's directed to a particular type of call on this wire. Why do I want to control it here? Because this is a shared resource about with everybody in my network. On a Ethernet, okay, so we've got gig Ethernet to the desktop. How big a deal is voice? Minuscule. What about across my wide area net? Wide area net is still expensive bandwidth. I don't want to put something on it that I don't have to. Okay. That's how we use that control. Okay. What we haven't talked about is how we get to anything that is not an IP-based system. We're going to look at how to build trunks to another IP system, but that's still a couple of weeks away. Actually, it's a little more than that. The first thing we need to start getting a handle on, I've, I've purposely avoided talking about any particular protocol. I've mentioned them in passing, but we really haven't dealt with the voice over IP protocol yet. So we're going to start looking at that. And the first thing we're going to look at is how, when you program like you did in the lab, how I take a generic phone or a generic soft phone and through the boot process turn it into my phone. What goes on under the hood with that? You, know, you saw the process called registration. You, know, you, watched the, you put your entries in, you turned on your soft phone, and you saw in the user registered, 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 all that when you made calls. How does that work? That's where I need to go. What am I describing? When I put stuff in, I'm controlling the network to deliver a call. What's that? What's the basic process of telephony that controls? Signaling. Signaling. What you're going to find is that moving the voice from here to here it's trivial. It's no big deal. I can describe the whole thing in one class period, and with the exception of a couple of caveats on how we apply it, that's really all you need to know on it. SIP or H323 or Skinny or any of those that you've heard about for voice over IP solutions are almost completely signaling solutions. That's where the problem is in doing this. Okay, um, 
Yeah. I'll check on I'll check on the problems with uh, Lab Station three and four. <laughs> I'm being me. Jimmy will check on them. I'll take credit for it. <laughs> and Wednesday, I would like you to have. If you haven't completed the lab, I need you to complete the lab by Wednesday. There is a write-up component. Please be aware of that. And we're going to dig a little further under the hood in there. Uh, give us a little bit of time this afternoon. Okay. Okay. So. All of them. That's a little bit of an oversimplification. Sig Voice over IP is primarily a signaling solution. Voice over IP systems still have to do all of those things. I still have to do transmission. I still have to do switching. And I still have to do signaling. It's just that the vast majority of what we have to deal with falls under the heading of signaling. 